A very good evening aspirants. Welcome to the Hindu News Analysis by Shankar IAS Academy for the day 9th of September 2021. So displayed below are the list of news articles that we'll be discussing in today's discussion and they're provided along with the page numbers of different editions and also the link for the handwritten notes in PDF format and the time stamping of the different articles are provided in the description box as well as in the comment section for the benefit of mobile phone viewers. So come let us get into our discussion. Now look at this news article. The news article reports about the minimum support prices that have been announced. See currently rates are fixed for 23 crops and crops like oil seeds and pulses such as mustard, safflower and masoor doll so higher MSP hikes of up to 8% in a bid to encourage crop diversification. So this is the crux of this news article. So in this context we will know about this MSP the minimum support price and we will also see a closely related concept called the fair and remunerative prices which is also made headlines in today's newspaper. See the MSP of the minimum support price is the rate at which the government purchases crops from farmers. So in other words minimum support price is the minimum price that is set by the government for certain agricultural products at which the products would directly be bought from the farmers. See, minimum support price is a form of government intervention to insure the farmers. Now, say for example, there comes a situation in which there is a steep decline in the prices of their produce in the market. So, at such a juncture, the farmers cannot sell their produce in profit. So, in order to help this loss, the government has come up with this concept of the minimum support price. So with the emergence of this price, even in cases where a farmer doesn't find the market selling price profitable, he can sell it to a government at the MSP. And there is no upper registration on the quantity as such. If you see, MSP is only an indicative price, that is market price can raise way above or way below MSP. So remember the market players or the farmers are not legally bound to keep their prices lower or higher than the MSP and it is up to the farmer's discretion whether to choose the place where he or she has to sell their produce. That is you can either choose between the government or the market. Remember the government of India sets the MSP twice a year, one for Rabi and one for Karif. Note that MSPs are declared during the sowing season. See, this particular period is chosen because it helps the farmers and also the investors to make a planned investment into the crop. See, the Commission for Agricultural Costs and Prices recommends the minimum support price. And for your information, this Commission for Agricultural Costs and Prices is a statutory body and it considers various factors to determine the prices. And the list of factors is given below for your reference. You can just go through that. Now, moving on further. Know that the government covers few crops under MSP and given below is a list of crops that is covered under MSP. So currently as per the news, this has been fixed for 23 crops which includes various cereals, pulses, oil seeds and other additional crops which are given below. So just have a look at it because it will be useful for you in your exam perspective. Now here when you carefully look at these crops, you can find that the sugar cane pricing is special that is it is issued separately under the sugarcane control order of 1966 under the essential commodities act of 1955 so for sugarcane it is the frp or the fair remunerative prices see this fair and remunerative price or frp is a price that is required to be paid by sugar mills and factories to sugarcane farmers and in contrast through MSP the farmers get paid from the government directly. See this system was introduced in the year 2009 and it replaced the concept of statutory minimum price and under this fair and remunerative system the price paid to farmers for sugarcane it is not linked to the profits generated by sugar mills. But instead, this fair and remunerative price is based on the recovery rate of sugar from sugarcane. That is, on how much sugar can be taken from 
a sugar cane and here you should also note that the fair and remunerative price is fixed by the central government in consultation with the state governments and the sugar mills now another related concept of this fair and remunerative price is the state advised price or the sap see it is a price that is announced by the state government over and above the fair and remunerative price for sugar cane and since sugar pricing comes under the concurrent list the supreme court has held that both the center as well as the state have got the power to fix the sugar cane prices and while the center's price is the minimum price state advised price that is always been higher than the center's fair and remunerative price by practice now coming to the difference between the fair and remunerative price and the minimum support price see while the frp and sap are different versions of the price for sugar cane that need to be paid by the mills to farmers this msp or the minimum selling price is the assured price of sugar for mills and the prices of sugar are usually market driven but in order to ensure that the industry gets at least the minimum cost of sugar production so as to clear the sugar cane price dues to farmers the concept of sugar msp has been introduced since the year 2018 and with this we have come to the end of this particular news discussion now let's move on to our next news analysis now look at this news article uh this particular article it mentions about a case of black fever that has been reported in the state of kerala now in this background we will learn some important points or some important informations about the said black fever see this black fever is a disease which is commonly known as kala azar in our country now when you take the term kala azar the word kala in that means black or also fatal and when you take azar it means fever or illness so basically this disease means black fever or fatal illness and the intensity of this particular disease is such intense that even the who has said that if this disease is not treated then there are high chances for the fatality rate in developing countries to be as high as 100% within 2 years of its occurrence and one more important fact about this particular disease is that it is a slow progressing disease and also a disease that is indigenous to india so having said that now let us see how this disease is caused see actually this is a vector borne disease and it is also known as the visceral leishmaniasis because it is one of the forms of leishmaniasis and also the most severe one among them now here leishmaniasis refers to a group of diseases which are caused by protozoan parasites from more than 20 leishmania species and usually these parasites are transmitted to humans by the bites of the infected female phlebotomine sandfly so basically this leishmaniasis and kala azar or visceral leishmaniasis is transmitted by sand fly so that you keep in mind now especially among the various leishmaniasis this said leishmaniasis is usually caused by the species of leishmania donovani and the leishmania infantum or leishmania chagasi so now we have an idea of how this disease is spread so now let us move on to see the various symptoms associated with this disease so some of the most prominent symptoms that are associated with this disease includes irregular cycle of fever substantial weight loss then the swelling of the spleen and liver and also anemia and apart from this also know that there is a known complication of kalazar and it is the post kalazar dermal leishmaniasis okay so this is shortly termed as pk dl so basically this uh, post kalazar dermal leishmaniasis is characterized by a discolored flat skin rash which is found on the face upper arms trunks and also on other parts of the body and this particular complication is mainly seen in the parts of east africa and also southeast asia and especially in the indian subcontinent 
So when you take this post colors are dermal leishmaniasis it usually occurs in patients who have recovered from the visceral leishmaniasis about which we saw a little earlier So usually this complication it appears 6 months to one or more years after the apparent cure of the visceral leishmaniasis and also note that this complication heals spontaneously in most cases in africa but then that spontaneous healing is found to be quite rare in india and according to the who an estimated 50000 to 90000 new cases of kalazar occur worldwide annually and among these most cases they occur in brazil in east africa and india and in the case of india around 54 districts of four states are endemic for this kalazar and these four states includes the states of bihar jharkhand west bengal and also uttar pradesh and adding to this leishmaniasis donavani is the parasite which is said to be causing this disease in india and particularly indian kalazar has got a unique epidemiological feature of being anthropogenic So for those who are not aware of this word anthropogenic pay attention see this word anthropogenic refers to it is transmissible from human to human and also that human is the only known reservoir of infection now here you should remember that the disease is not contagious i'll repeat this disease is not contagious but this uh, disease is basically spread by the female sand flies who pick up parasites while feeding on an infected human host the different stages involved in this particular disease is given below in the form of a picture so you can just go through it in order to have a more better understanding of the disease so with this let's wind up this particular discussion about the black fever or kalazar and with the learn points in mind now let us move on to see what the next news article has got to tell us now look at this news article the news article mentions that indian ocean is likely to be affected by tsunamis which are generated mainly by earthquakes from the makran subduction zone so in order to understand this article first we need to know about tsunamis and also about the makran subduction zone that is mentioned in today's discussion so what exactly is this tsunami see tsunami is a natural disaster uh, which is typically a very large and powerful wave and this particular term has got its origin from japan and it literally means harbor wave so when you look at the causes of tsunami mainly tsunami is caused by earthquakes under the sea and these earthquakes are not the only casual factor but they are also volcanic eruptions that is taking place under the sea and apart from this even the coastal landslides and also the meteor impact can also be responsible for a tsunami see these events are said to cause a tsunami because these events cause the sea floor to move abruptly and this abrupt movement will result in the sudden displacement of ocean water and it is this displaced water which appears in the form of high vertical waves and these waves are called tsunamis or seismic sea waves which travel to the coast see moreover the impact of tsunami is less over the ocean and it is also more near the coast because near the coast they cause large scale devastations mainly because of the speed of the wave and the speed of the wave in the ocean depends upon the depth of the water that is the speed is more in the shallow water than in the ocean deep this is because over deep water the tsunami has got very long wavelength and also limited wave height but then when the tsunami waves enter the shallow water its wavelength gets reduced which eventually leads to the increase in the wave height and now since near the coast there is more shallow water the speed of the wave is found to be having more greater wave height and sometimes this wave height can also reach up to 15 meter or more and such waves are also called as shallow water waves and these waves has got the potential to cause large scale destructions along the shores this is because when tsunami waves reach the coast they release enormous amount of energy that is stored in them 
so the water in these waves they flow turbulently onto the land and it destroys everything that comes in its way and we know that generally the coastal areas are densely populated so therefore the laws of life and property will is found to be much higher in these coastal areas when compared to the other areas in case of a tsunami as compared to other natural disasters and also note that tsunamis are frequently observed along the pacific ring of fire particularly along the coast of alaska japan philippines and other islands of southeast asia and apart from this they are also found along the coast of indonesia malaysia myanmar sri lanka and india etc and in fact as we all know india witnessed a devastating tsunami back in the year 2004 Now coming back to the news see why are we concerned about this makran subduction zone see as we know the outermost layer of the earth is fragmented and they are called a plate so usually these plates are in a continual motion so due to this these plates collide and in the process one plate goes under another so during this movement one plate is drawn back into the earth's mantle and this process is called subduction and this process causes the disturbance in the earth's crust which is nothing but an earthquake so here the zone where the process happens is called as the subduction zone and usually in such zones the most powerful earthquakes tsunamis volcanic eruption and also landslides occur and coming to this makran subduction zone it is present in the northern arabian sea and it is also in proximity to india and this is a reason why it has become a matter of concern for india so with this understanding let's get into our next discussion now look at this editorial This particular article is about hydrogen as a source of fuel. So let us look at it in detail. The syllabus covered by this editorial is given below. See as we know hydrogen is the most abundant element on the planet and in the recent times hydrogen as a fuel source has started to gain attraction due to its clean nature. Now here you have to note two things. One is that hydrogen is a clean burning fuel. that is when hydrogen is combined with oxygen in a fuel cell hydrogen produces heat and electricity and only water vapor will be the by product and secondly hydrogen is not available in free form because it is always combined with another species of atom and this is the reason why it is called as an energy carrier and since it is combined with another species of atom it becomes really difficult to separate it so based on the separation techniques that is based on the methods of separating the hydrogen the hydrogen is differentiated based on various color codes so we have various types of hydrogen say like that of gray hydrogen blue hydrogen green hydrogen black hydrogen pink hydrogen etc so in this discussion we are going to see about each of these hydrogen in brief and we are also going to see about the green hydrogen and why it has gained attraction in the recent times and also we are going to see about the associated shortcomings of the green hydrogen as well so first comes the blue hydrogen see in blue hydrogen the source is methane from natural gas as we know natural gas is a form of fossil fuel and when this hydrogen is made the resulting carbon dioxide will be captured but this captured carbon dioxide will not be released into the atmosphere now next comes gray hydrogen which is also the hydrogen which is produced using natural gas but then in this hydrogen the carbon dioxide that is produced has a by product it will be released into the atmosphere adding to the greenhouse effect so unfortunately this gray hydrogen accounts for roughly 95% of the hydrogen that is produced in the world today and related to this is the black hydrogen which is also produced by burning fossil fuels but then it is produced using more dirty forms like that of coal and next we have in line the pink hydrogen which is produced by means of electrolysis and this electrolysis it needs fuel which is supplied from sources like 
nuclear sources and lastly we have the green hydrogen see among all the hydrogen which we saw so far the green hydrogen is the cleanest of all the hydrogen and the reason for this is because during the production of gray and blue hydrogen carbon dioxide is obtained as a byproduct whereas during the production of green hydrogen there are no such emissions and this is because green hydrogen is produced using renewable energy like that of solar and wind and since it is produced using renewable energy there is no such emissions during its production whereas on the other hand gray and blue hydrogen are produced using hydrocarbons so coming to the present where the climate change is kicking in and also at the time when the world is growing energy hungry this hydrogen is holding a promising future for the world and some of the reasons why this green hydrogen is preferred is that it has high energy density than that of fossil fuels like diesel and also it is the cleanest source of fuel and besides this hydrogen is also abundantly available so there is no need for us to run out of hydrogen ever and apart from this it is also the safest fuel source that is we don't have hazards like that of nuclear power plants so by now you may ask me a question if hydrogen is so advantageous then why not use it immediately see the reason for it is that it is also got some glitches as well see storing and transporting green hydrogen is really difficult why because the hydrogen is an highly flammable gas and not just that it also occupies a lot of space and can make steel pipes brittle so because of this specialized pipelines must be built but building these pipelines is quite costly and another reason is that for transportation through pipes pressurizing the gas or cooling it to a liquid is essential but doing that requires a lot of energy and this process is also energy intensive so this has got the potential to undermine the green hydrogen's round trip efficiency that is we spend more energy on transporting or making it to a liquid compared to what we get as energy from hydrogen and besides now if we want green energy we need only renewable source of energy for its production so a lot of cheap renewable source of green hydrogen is essential which the world still doesn't have because we are still on fossils and another major issue is the cost the international energy agency has put the cost of green hydrogen at 3 to 7.50 us dollars per kg so this makes the fuel very expensive as well but however in spite of being expensive and in spite of having a lot of shortcomings the author here feels that in order to counter the climate change and also the carbon emission green hydrogen holds the promise and this is true for india as well because we currently consume around 5.5 million tons of hydrogen and india's 2021 to 22 budgets also announced the national hydrogen energy mission see this national hydrogen mission is nothing but a planning to focus on the generation of hydrogen from green power resources or to put it in simple words it focuses on green hydrogen because it is really imperative for the world to circumvent the glitches in green hydrogen production in order to have a sustainable future in the longer run and with this let us wind up this editorial article and move on to the next news discussion now let us take up this article for our next discussion see this particular editorial talks about the issue of reservations for the government school students so with this idea in mind let's move into our discussion the syllabus relevant to this article is mentioned here for your reference see recently a few months back the odisha government proposed a 15% reservation for government school students in medical and engineering colleges and this particular editorial is written in that background So according to the government this said proposal has been made in order to reduce the inequity that is arising due to the lack of physical and economic access to coaching institutions or to understand better see not every government school student have got the potential nor can access or afford 
the coaching institutions in order to get through the entrance examinations for medical and engineering colleges. So in order to reduce this prevailing inequality, the Odisha government has come up with this reservation policy. So in this background, the author here is trying to throw light on whether this reservation policy will actually play a role or will actually benefit the government school students. See, a number of reports has highlighted the poor condition of government schools in many parts of India and we ourselves in our discussion have come across a lot of reports and indices which says that a lot more has to be done in the rural and urban government school structure in order to impart the best of education. And Odisha is not an exception in this case. See, more than 62% of students in the state of Odisha, they go to government schools. So at such a juncture, reserving seats in higher technical institutions for government school students, instead of focusing on improving the standards of these government institutions, has become a matter of concern. See, here the author is saying that if the state provides the students with good education, there is no need for the state to bring up such reservation policy because with a standard and capable education, the children themselves can get into the higher technical institution on the basis of their own merit without the use of any reservations as such. But instead, the state here has proposed this reservation policy without thinking on how to improve the current system of education that is prevailing in the government school system as of now. And apart from this, the author also mentions that the state has failed in its duty to provide the good education by announcing this particular policy. See, this particular decision is actually bringing to light that there is no clear or no serious plan of action to improve the functioning of the government schools. So, this de decision actually reflects a lack of political will that is prevailing among the government when it comes to improving the state of school education. See, when you look back decades ago, the students from Orisha, they had a very high success rate in national level competitive exams and of course this is because of the strong educational foundation that was laid in the government run schools and even the teachers back then were also known for their unquestionable sincerity and integrity. So in the course of time things have changed and it is not the same at present. See there is no scarcity for ideas or strategies that the government can come up to structure or to improve the government schools and their educational quality but the thing which is missing here is the government's willingness to pursue these initiatives instead of bringing about some reservation policies the government can opt in for ideas like the capacity building of teachers in order to implement new pedagogic practices and also ideas to emphasize the language teaching and also to fill up the various vacant teaching posts and also the government can also think of ways to change the mindset of people and policy makers regarding the government schools as well. But what the government here has done is instead of adopting for such practical and rational policies, the government has drawn out certain policies like the automatic promotion of students to higher classes without passing examinations. See this is not only really going to hinder the growth of the students but it is also going to make the problems faced by these students even more worsen. See some people may argue that the quota would benefit the people who have been denied access to good education and also suitable jobs for a longer period of time but here also there is a concern that need to be addressed because the quota benefits has got the potential to be dominated by the creamy layer students who have better access to coaching and also other technology enabled resources so uh, to understand better see among the many government school students there may be persons from creamy layers as well so those people they have uh, better access to technology and coaching and learning compared to the others. So at such instances what happens is the quota has got the potential to benefit them that is the creamy layer students just because they have got high chances of performing well due to the access to coaching and other learning 
materials and apart from this there could also be a benefit sharing bias in the city viewed in either of the ways the entire purpose of the reservation will be defeated so by now we have a kind of conceptual clarity about odisha's reservation policy and also the associated concerns and the various criticisms that are related to it so now having done all these let us now conclude the article by saying what is the way forward in this regard see of course rebuilding institution may be a tougher task but then the state cannot simply get away with this responsibility of improving the education in government schools because an overwhelming majority of the children study there so having this in mind and being aware of the role played by the government schools the state should focus on building the morale of teachers and also the students to come back even stronger and apart from this the states can also equip the students with the requisite competence or the essential skills that are required that or that are helpful for these students to get admitted in various higher technical institutions and with this we have come to the end of this particular news discussion now let's move on to the next part of our hindu news analysis Now for our next news discussion we have taken this particular news article and this news article mentions that the Karnataka chief minister has urged the union road transport minister to take up the development of the remaining part of the satellite town ring road see this satellite town ring road aims to improve and augment the road network and it also aims to control and regulate the developments in the Bangalore metropolitan region and note that the remaining part is urged to be taken under the Bharat Mala Pariyojana so in this slide let's see very briefly on some important points about this Bharat Mala Pariyojana see this Bharat Mala Pariyojana is an umbrella program for the highway sector and this program focuses on optimizing efficiency of freight and passenger movement across the country and this program will be done by bridging critical infrastructure gaps say like that of the gaps that are prevailing in existing highways infrastructure so some of the key objectives of this bharat mala pariyojana are to improve the connectivity in the northeast the seamless connectivity with neighboring countries and also the improvement in efficiency of existing corridors through development of multimodal logistics park etc and additionally under the scheme special attention is also given to fulfill the connectivity needs of backward and tribal areas and then also the connectivity needs in the areas of economic activity places of religious and tourist interest broad border areas and coastal areas are also focused so on a whole 50 national corridors have been envisaged under this bharat mala pariyojana and it will help to connect around 550 districts in the country through the national highway linkages and this is also expected to enhance the freight movement in the national highway by around 70 to 80% so therefore this bharat mala pariyojana will also have a positive impact on logistic performance index of the country now adding to all this another benefit of this bharat mala pariyojana is that it helps in generating a large number of direct and indirect employment because employment will not only be generated due to the construction activities under this program but also the better road connectivity will enhance the economic activity across the entire country as well so this in turn will help in generating employment opportunities note that since it is a large scheme it is divided into seven distinct phases and the first phase is under construction and this phase 1 is to be implemented over a period of 5 years spanning from 2017 to 18 to 2021 to 22 so a total of around 24800 kilometers is envisaged in this first phase and for your additional information the components of this first phase are the economic corridors development inter corridor and feeder roads the national corridors efficiency movements border and international connectivity roads then the coastal and port connectivity roads and also expressways and apart from this the projects under this phase 1 are also implemented through the national highways authority of india 
द नेशनल हाईवेज एंड इंफ्रास्ट्रक्चर डेवलपमेंट कॉरपोरेशन लिमिटेड द मिनिस्ट्री ऑफ रोड ट्रांसपोर्ट एंड हाईवेज एंड द स्टेट पब्लिक वर्क डिपार्टमेंट सो दीज आर सम ऑफ द इम्पॉर्टेंट डिटेल्स आर यू नीड टू हैव इन माइंड वेन एवर यू कम अक्रॉस दिस भारत माला परियोजना सो विद दिस वी हैव कम टू द एंड ऑफ द आर्टिकल डिस्कशन having done with the articles for today now let us move on to the next segment of our indo news analysis that is the practice question discussion now let us take up this practice question with reference to the state advised price consider the following statements statement 1 this is a pricing mechanism for sugarcane statement 2 the fair and remunerative price announced by the center is always higher than the state advised price See from our discussion, we know that the first statement is right. Now moving on to the second statement. See first, the center announces the fair and remunerative price, and then the state announces the state advised price after the fair and remunerative price. So to support the state's farmers, the state generally fixes a higher state advised price compared to that of the fair and remunerative price, if not for same. so this shows that the second statement given here is incorrect and since we need to find only the correct answer the right answer here is option a that is one only now see this question which of the following statements is or are correct with reference to bharat mala pariyojana statement 1 it focuses on optimizing efficiency of both freight and passenger movement across the country statement 2 it aims to create choke points in golden quadrilateral and the north south east west corridor and statement 3 it also includes the development of coastal roads border and international connectivity roads so we need to find the correct statements here see when you take the first statement as we saw in our discussion this particular project focuses on optimizing the efficiency of both freight and passenger movement across the country so statement 1 is correct coming to the second statement see a choke point is a narrow route providing passage to or through another region and generally these choke points are congested so this particular project actually aims to decongest these choke points of golden quadrilateral and the north south east west corridor and this will be carried out through lane expansion construction of ring roads bypasses or elevated corridors and logistic points at identified points so this statement is incorrect now coming to the third statement see this statement given here is correct since the development of coastal roads border and international connectivity roads are the components of this bharat mala pariyojana and since we need to identify only the correct options the right answer here is option b that is 1 and 3 only now look at this practice question about the colors are or the black disease statement 1 colors are is targeted for eradication under the national vector borne diseases control program and statement 2 says that The National Vector Borne Diseases Control Program aims for achieving annual incidence of colors are of less than one case per ten thousand population at block level. So from this we need to find the correct answer. See when you take the first statement, this statement is incorrect because the National Vector Borne Diseases Control Program they aim for elimination of the disease and not the eradication of the disease. so when i say eradication of a particular disease it, it refers to the permanent reduction of the disease to zero of the worldwide incidences of infection which are caused by the specific agent as a result of deliberate efforts and when intervention measures are no longer needed however vector borne diseases are usually caused by vector and the vector is climate sensitive and also it is ecologically driven so this vector is usually affected by temperature humidity rainfall etc and therefore it is not possible to eradicate the vector borne diseases completely from the world so that makes the first statement incorrect now coming to the second statement see a government aims for colors are elimination as a public health problem and the definition for this is to achieve 
annual incidence of less than one case per 10,000 population at block level. And all the efforts are being made to achieve the annual incidence of less than one case per 10,000 population in all the endemic blocks across the 54 districts in four states by the end of the year 2000. 21. So once achieved, the elimination is to be sustained for around three years for Kalazar elimination certification. So that makes this second statement to be correct. So since only the second statement is correct here, the right option for this question is option B, that is two only. Now look at this prelims practice question. Consider the following statements with reference to Makran subduction zone. Statement 1, it marks the boundary between the Arabian and the Indian plate. Statement 2, it is along the southern coasts of Iran and Pakistan. Statement 3, it is one of the world's least studied subduction zones. See, statement 1 is incorrect and statement 2 is correct. See, the Makran subduction zone is located in the southeast of Iran and southeastern Pakistan and it extends for almost 900 km along the Eurasian Arabian plate boundary and not Indian plate. And coming to the third statement, this statement is correct because it is one of the world's least studied subduction zones. So the right answer here is option D that is 2 and 3 only. The list of main questions is displayed below. You can write your answers and post them in the comment section. So with this we have come to the end of today's Indo News analysis and if you have liked the video then don't forget to like, comment and share and do subscribe to Shankar IAS Academy YouTube channel for more updates regarding UPSC Civil Services Preparation.